the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Word of the Lord tonight. Praise God. Praise God. Well, listen, you didn't come to hear from me. Didn't come to hear from Pastor Jim, Pastor Deb, Pastor Luke, any of us here. No, never go to church to hear from a man. What are you doing going to church to hear from a man? This is about us coming together and hearing from the Holy Spirit because he is the teacher of the church. And he's the one that's going to not just give you information, but a revelation that changes your heart and your life as you practically work it out in each and every day. So come on, let's honor the Lord. Stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord in prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to come and be the teacher of the church. Father, tonight, it's so good to be in your presence. Lord, what a joy it is to sing your praises and to worship you. God, thank you, Lord, that tonight we can come into the house of God freely, openly, with warm air and lights, God. We're, we're so grateful, God. Thank you, Lord, that you are a God who hears our prayers, Lord, and you answer and thank you that all the promises of God are yes and amen in him. And Father God, we approach your throne tonight. And Father God, we find mercy and grace to help in a time of need. And so, Lord, we ask that you would just give grace to the hearer tonight. Lord, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown this night. Lord, we praise you and thank you that, Holy Spirit, you come and teach us, be our guide, direct, and, and, and give us the vision that we need. And, Lord, we just thank you for what you're going to do in our hearts and our lives. God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say amen. amen. You may be seated. Grab your Bibles. Open it up to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 5. We're going to be kind of towards the end of 1 Peter chapter number 5. Tonight I want to talk to you about a message called putting together what has fallen apart. Putting together what has fallen apart. Sometimes in our lives we find out that things or even ourselves fall apart. Can you say amen? amen. Now this can happen for many reasons. Could be that, uh, you know, use, wear and tear. Sometimes it's fatigue. Sometimes it's stress, sometimes it's pressure, whatever it may be, we, we know that as we go through life, whether it's a thing, whether it's a, you know, a relationship, maybe, maybe it's our, our stability, maybe it's finances, maybe it's a family, there are things in our life or there are people oftentimes or even ourselves at times will fall apart. And whatever the reason is, we have to be wise enough to know that just because something falls apart doesn't mean that that's the end. Doesn't mean that it's, it's failed one time and that's it, that's all you get. You should have done better, you should have been stronger, you, you, you should have been cooler, should have been more educated, you, you should have been a super Christian that never has a moment of weakness. No, God is not looking for that. God is looking for us to take our mess, bring it to him, he'll fix it and make it our message. And so we got to find out from the Word of God what it means to put together what has fallen apart. And whatever the case is, we're told in the Word that we don't have to continually fall apart, that that's not the end, that's not failure, that's not final. We can be whole and we can be put back together. The Bible uses some interesting words to talk about putting things back together. It uses the word complete in some translations. A, a, a better word that the Bible uses, and it uses it even more, especially in some translations, it uses the word perfect. Now, we have an issue with this word perfect because we know that in the flesh, no one's perfect. We've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. And so how can I be perfect? Well, you can't be perfect as in uh, 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 according to sin or according to that, that sort of perfection. There's only one who is perfect. His name is Jesus. But now, did you know that the word of God has called you and I to be perfect? And sometimes we see a charge like that and we say, well, Lord, wait a second. I've already messed up. I've already fallen apart. How can I be perfect? Well, take a moment with me, and, and I know you got 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. Look up on the overhead, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, that, that almost adds a, a whole new 
level to us because we say, oh, wait a second, you know, Jesus walked on the earth, Jesus was in the flesh, but now all of a sudden you're going to direct me to the Father who is spirit, the one who is holy, the one who dwells in unapproachable light, the one who, whose face cannot, cannot be seen in the flesh on the earth, and you're telling me I shall be perfect just as my Father in heaven is perfect? I mean, that's a tall order. That really is something that's, that's greater than we can understand, greater than we can imagine. If you view perfection according to sin and according to the flesh, you're never going to measure up like that. But when you view perfection just as your Father in heaven is perfect, when you view it in the proper light, you'll understand that, hey, we can do this. Why? Because God has given us the ability to do this. God has given us the grace to do this. What is it talking about when it says to be perfect? Well, it's talking about to be complete. To be totally equipped with everything you need, that means that you are now perfect. It, it, think of it like this. If you've got somebody that's in the army, that person that's in the army, they enlist and they go and they sign their paperwork and they get everything ready and they have their physical exam and all that kind of stuff and, and they show up on the day that they're supposed to show up and they get on a bus and they go out to their training camp. They're at the training camp, they come up to a table, and at that table they have a pair of pants, they got a set of boots, they've got a shirt, they've got a jacket, they've got a weapon, they've got a manual that tells them everything that they need to know about how to be a soldier, right? If that soldier gets off that bus and walks over to the table and looks at it and says, hmm, I don't need none of this. And they walk over and they leave and they get on a plane and fly over to a nation that's at war and they get into the battle, they're going to die, right? Why? Because they're not perfect. They're incomplete. They don't have everything that they need. But if that same soldier gets off the bus, walks up to the table and says, okay, I, I need a size 33 waist, 33 length. That's my size, by the way. I know that's kind of an odd size, but that's just the way it is. But they say, I need, I need a size 10 shoe. I, I need a size extra medium shirt. And, and, I need, and I need a jacket that will go over me. And then they get out their, their, their weapon and their training manual and they learn and they develop their skills. Now they are perfect. They are the perfect soldier. Why? Because they are complete. They're not lacking anything. And when they go into battle, they're going to be victorious. Is that right? All right. Good. I'm glad that two of you agree with me. <laughs> but we see in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 10, that God involves himself in this process of perfection. You're there in 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at verse number 10. It says, but may the God of all grace. Now we got to stop right there for a second. What is grace? God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. That means that whatever you're lacking, God can fulfill. Where you're weak, he is strong. Where you are incomplete, God will complete you. Is that right? Why? Because it's grace. Grace comes in and makes up the difference. Grace comes in and gives you the strength that you need. Grace comes in and gives you the wisdom. Grace comes in and gives you the favor. Grace comes in and gets the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. Why? Because in the flesh, you can't. Can't do it. Can't be perfect. But by his grace, you can be complete. You can be outfitted with everything you need for every work. So, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered... A while. Now that's one of those little lines in scriptures that I wish I could just take a little white out and just kind of dab it over those words and, and it would be that way in my life. Why? Because I don't like to suffer. Maybe you do. Oh, you don't? No. I don't think anybody likes to suffer. But the Bible is very clear and, and expresses directly that as Christians, we are going to go through some stuff, that there's going to be some trials, there's going to be temptations, there's going to be pressures, there's going to be stresses of life that are going to try to get you to fall apart, going to wear you down, going to tear you up, going to use you and abuse you to try and get you as a Christian to fall apart. But we're not talking about falling apart. We're talking about putting together, right? And God gets involved in the process. That's why he's the God of all grace who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while. Now, God is not waiting up in the heavenlies, looking at your life and saying, hmm, have they suffered enough? That's not what this verse is saying. This verse is saying that 
throughout your lifetime that there will be suffering, and after you have suffered a while, that's something God's going to get involved in. God's grace will be put into action. That God is coming on the scene. That God is interested in your life. That God is involved in your life. And as you go through these trials, God gets involved in doing something. Look at what he does. After you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Wow. Wow. Now, once again, we see that word perfect. After you have suffered a while, the very first thing he does is perfects you. So in the process, it starts with suffering. Now, I wish it doesn't have to be that way. I wish we could just skip to the good stuff, right? But in life, stuff happens. Trials happen. Temptations happen. Pressures happen. Finances go away. They come in. There's abundance. There's need. There's friends, and then there's enemies, right? There, there, there's good times, and there's bad times. There's all sorts of things that we go through in life. There's the ups and downs, the lefts and rights, all those kinds of things. And so after you have suffered a while in that process, suffering comes first, and then God gets on the scene by his grace, and he does something. He starts with perfection. Now, that word perfect, we see that this is where God comes in, and, he, and, he, and the word really, if you look at this word here, it really speaks of restoration. Uh, another great word for this is mending. Could also say to repair or strengthen or to put in order, to arrange or to prepare. So, so let's read it with that, with that sort of understanding. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect or restore you, mend you, repair you, strengthen you, put you in order, arrange you and prepare you. Wow. Now all of a sudden the verse starts to explode with understanding. The word is also used of the disciples mending their nets. Think about that for a second. Here's the disciples. They were fishermen, right? And they had nets that they caught their fish with. They would cast their nets out of the boat, and then they would take the line, and they would pull the nets back in. And those nets, as they went out, would surround fish and whatever else was in the water, and then it would have to be pulled back. But not only did it have the weight and the pressure of the fish, also it had the weight and the pressure of the water and gravity as they were pulling it out. So there was a stress and there was a strain on these nets. And so the nets oftentimes would tear or they would fall apart. And so the disciples had to take time after fishing after each time and they would sit down and they would find those tears. They would find those places of, of great stress where it started to fray and started to fall apart and they would restore, they would repair, they would set an order, they would arrange, they would mend, they would perfect their nets. You and I, when we go through trials and when we go through pressures and when we go through stresses, in life, after we have suffered a while, after we have toiled through the night, after we have let it out and we have pulled it in, God sits down with our lives and he takes a look at those areas of stress, areas of pressure, areas where we are falling apart and by his grace, he starts to mend us. He starts to set us in order. He starts to arrange us and he starts to perfect us. That's the work of grace. It's also used in, in Scripture of setting a bone, broken bone. Think about that for a second. If you have a broken bone, like let's say a leg, you had a broken leg, that, that, that bone has been broken and it has been breached. Now there's no more strength. You can't use it any longer. And so what do they have to do before they put a cast on something? See, you can put a cast on something and still be broke and heal the wrong way and you still can't use it. So what do they have to do? They have to set that bone in proper alignment and they have to arrange it and put it straight where it needs to be so that when they set the bone, it will heal properly and will be able to be used in the end. Is that right? Let's look at the verse again. But may the God of all grace who called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while, after you're broke, after you've fallen apart, May he perfect you. May he set you in the right place. Establish you. That's like wrapping that cast around the foot. Strengthen. That's the healing time. And settle you. 
In other words, cause you to be healed and useful once again. Hallelujah. In the Old Testament, we find that there's a similar word that speaks of repairing and restoring the house of God when it was run down. It also speaks of strengthening oneself or encouraging someone else. It really has to do with making something strong. It's even commanded by God to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. What's he saying? He's saying, repair yourself. You're falling apart, Joshua. You got great battles ahead of you. You need to be strengthened. Let me set you up for success. Let, let me repair where the stress has worn you down. Be strong and of good courage. Then later on in the same book, Joshua starts telling the people, only be strong and of good courage. What happened? Joshua received that impartation of grace into his life, and now he is in turn turning it around to the people of God, and he's putting that same thing in order in their lives, and he's using the gift that God has given him now for someone else, and he's setting them up for success too. Other times the prophetic voice or the charge of a father to a son strengthened and encouraged the one receiving the charge. We find that from David to his son Solomon. Solomon, be strong. Find that in the prophetic voice. Don't be afraid of this army that's coming against you. Only be strong. What is, what's going on? There's a, there's a mending process. There's a restoration process. There is an encouragement. There is a, a, a building up, a strengthening on the inside. It's easy. And, and I'm saying this because I know it. I, I go through it. I'm going through it. Hello. Right. It's easy to let the world to let pressures, to let stresses, to let temptations, to let finances, to let family relationships. It's easy to let all these things wear you down until you start to fall apart. It's easy. But when you take time with the Lord and when you get into the presence of God and you allow the work of God to impart grace and ability into your life, then you will now be restored and set up and strengthened where you were once weak. So the question is, how do we get it together? How do we get it together? See, we're talking about putting together what has fallen apart. We found out how to fall apart. That's easy. How to fall apart is live your life. How to fall apart is go through trials. How to fall apart is go through pressure. How to fall apart is go through stress or just you. Sometimes we get wore down just because we're doing the day-to-day. -day. Same thing today as it was yesterday. Same thing tomorrow as it was today, right? And just because we're going through the same motions over and over and over and over again, we start to get wore out until we start to fall apart. God does not want that for our lives. God wants us to get it together. So how do we get it together? A couple of things that I want to minister to you tonight. Number one is in church. How do we get together in church? Now, I, I, I don't have time because there are so many scriptures that reference the importance of the church, that the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. That means that you do not have anything holding you up if you don't got church in your life. How about this one in the book of Psalms? It talks about those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. See, whatever you are in the world comes from the root of who you are in Christ. And, and, and that comes from your relationship and your establishment in the church. That, that the church is Christ's body in which he moves and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. See, see, the church is so important to you and I, and we don't have time to get into all that. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to focus on how church puts you back together. Is that all right? Okay, because we could talk churchology another time and in another place. Ephesians chapter 4, please. Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4... We're going to start in verse number 11 and read through verse number 16. When you get Ephesians 4, 11, say amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says, And he himself, speaking of Jesus, gave some. So notice this isn't everybody. This is some. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, we can stop right there and get really depressed because sometimes people look at that and they say, well, I'm not, a, I'm not an apostle. I mean, come on, I'm, I'm not sent to do any great missionary work. You know, I, I don't know that I could do that. Sometimes we look at this and say, oh, I'm, I'm not a prophet. 
I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not an evangelist. I, you know, I, I could tell someone about Jesus, but the ministry of an evangelist, that's not me. Sometimes we look at this and we say pastors and teachers. Well, that's for the elect few. They get to, you know, be a part of what's going on there at the church. I just sit in the, in the seat, in the sanctuary, and warm up a spot. But see, the thought's not done yet. Notice that after the word teachers, there's not a period. He's still going. See, there was not chapter and verse when this letter was written. So verse number 11 is followed by verse number 12. Verse number 12 says four. In other words, there was a purpose. There was a reason why God gave some to be apostles, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, some to be prophets. There was a reason. Why is that reason? Four. Here's the purpose. For the equipping of the saints. Did you know that when you were born again, you became a saint? Now no longer are you that old rank sinner. No, now in Christ Jesus, you are a saint of God. That's how God views you, that's how God sees you, and that's the way that you are getting your life in order so that you can become what you are. Hello. So our purpose as the ministry gifts is not just to be, oh, look at me, see how cool I am, see what, no, we've got a purpose. It's for a reason. It's for the equipping of the saints. Well, he goes on, for the work of the ministry. Wait, I, I thought only the people that were paid by the church got to do the work of the ministry. I, I thought it was just for those lead volunteers, those special elite forces, that they get to do the work of the ministry. Oh, no, no, no. God didn't want us crippled and, and relying on the faithful few. No, God said, if I can get everybody in the church now to view themselves as a full-time minister, we have multiplied our effectiveness to the nth degree. Are you listening? So let me ask you a question. How many full-time ministers do we have in the house tonight? All right. If you didn't raise your hand and you're born again, you, you did the wrong thing. <laughs> you are a full-time minister, whether you knew it or not. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That means building up. That means uh, uh, like almost like an edifice. You think about a structural thing going on. For that building up, for that edifice, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man. So when we do our job and you guys get involved and you get a hold of it and you do your job, now all of a sudden everybody's starting to do the work of the ministry. Everybody views themselves as a full-time minister. What happens? All of a sudden the body of Christ is built up and edified and strengthened on the inside until we are a perfect man, until we are a complete man, until we have everything that we need on the inside of us. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let me ask you something. How tall is Jesus? You say, well, when he was on the earth, he was a Jewish man, and, and he, he walked the earth, and you know, the average height of a Jewish man back in 2,000 years ago might have been about five foot five, five foot six. Yes, but my Jesus is now living in a glorified body. My Jesus now is waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. And the Bible says that the earth is his footstool. And so on a cosmic scale, oh, wait, and, and, and hold on a second, because he, he rolled out the heavens like a scroll. He stretched the universe. So how tall is your Jesus? And my Bible says, till we all come to the fullness of the stature of Christ. What does that mean? That means that as big as your God is, when he stands up, that's the influence that God wants to have in his church. Yeah. Verse 14, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. In other words, there's going to be people that are going to try and get you off course and try and get you off track. Paul called them savage wolves that rise up from amongst you. Listen, you better be careful about people that want to take you out of a good, solid, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. If somebody comes and says, hey, you know, we don't preach like that. We've got the truth. And, and, and you know what? We're the only ones that got the truth. You can say you sure got something, but you don't got me. 
Why? Because they know if they can get you out of church, they can get you vulnerable, get you to fall apart. And whenever somebody wants you to rely on man instead of relying on God, they're relying on the wrong thing. And your life will fall apart and will fail until you are put in a place where they direct your attention to Jesus and where they get you on track with God. See, that's what church is all about, is glorifying God. This is not about lifting up celebrity pastors, not about us pushing product on you guys. It's not about a sales pitch or any of that kind of stuff. It's about getting you guys to develop Christ in you so that when you stand up and stand against the trials of this world, now Jesus stands on your behalf, and how tall is your Jesus? What can stand against a God who's taller than the universe? Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Verse 16, this is where I wanted to get. This is how church puts you back together. From whom the whole body. Now listen, the Bible says that we are the body of Christ. The church of the living God is the body of Christ on the earth. From whom the whole body, so talking about Jesus, from whom the whole body joined and knit together together. Didn't say that Christ was separating you and dividing you and letting you fall apart. No, when you come into church and when you get built up in the things of God and you start to realize your purpose and you start to see yourself as a full-time minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ and now you start to stand up into maturity, no longer being like a kid tossed to and fro. No, now you're growing up into the head who is Jesus Christ. He now takes your life that was falling apart and he knits you together into the body of Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working. By which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. That's how church puts you back together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, if you ever come to church and your life is falling apart, you get into the presence of God, you lift your hands, you sing with all of your heart, you cry your tears, you blow snot everywhere. People around you are wondering if you're okay. You listen to the message and you shout amen. You write your notes and you, you dog ear your Bible and you do everything you can. And then you leave this place. All of a sudden, you feel tall. Shoulders are back, heads up. You walked in slumped over and hunched down, but no, you left like a champ. You left like the victor. Why? Because you just got edified in church. That's how church puts you back together. Tonight, how do we get it together? Number one is in church. Number two, number two is in prayer and perseverance. Second way, how do we get it together? In prayer and perseverance. We find a man by the name of Samson whose life fell apart because he got off track with women. At the end of his life, here he is in chains. They've gouged out his eyes. And what does he do? He prays to the Lord, God, remember me. And he asked God that he would strengthen him. And after he had fallen apart, God gives him strength to have a greater victory in his death than in his life. You remember the story. He asked the young man, can you lead me to the pillars that hold up the temple? And he leads him to the pillars. And there in between the pillars, Samson, this man whose strength was sapped, now is strengthened by God. He is mended. He is restored. He is repaired. And he pushes those pillars apart. And the whole temple collapses. And he kills more people in his death than he did during his life. Wow. How about when King David and his band of men were out raiding and they got raided, right? Here's David who was running. Here's David whose life had fallen apart. Here's David who who was on the enemy's side. He was a part of the enemy's camp. He was camped out in the enemy's territory, even wanting to go to war with them. But they wouldn't let him. He's been acting crazy, right? And and, and so now here he is, the raiders have been raided, and what does it say? They come together and they find out that their camp has smoke coming out of it. They race down there, all of their families are gone, all of their animals are gone, all of their goods are gone, and they sit down and they fall apart. The men start to say, hey, listen, I'm not having any of this. We need to get some stones and kill David. He did this. He's the one that led us out here. He's the one that acted crazy. He's the one that led us into the enemy's territory. Let's kill him. What does he do? David sits down, and the Bible says that he strengthened himself in the Lord and went and recovered all 
that was lost. Why is that? Because he strengthened himself in the Lord. He prayed and he persevered. Word also gives us a picture of a wall that had fallen apart in Nehemiah's day. In fact, while I describe it, you can turn there with me to the book of Nehemiah. If you go past Proverbs and Psalms and Job, you'll find Esther. Keep going. Right behind Esther is Nehemiah. And go to Nehemiah chapter number 6. We see that as they're building this wall, they're working together and they're, and they're restoring, they're repairing the breaches in the wall. They're, they're setting things in order. They're arranging things because that wall represented stability. That wall represented safety. That wall represented the favor of God and the blessing of God upon Jerusalem, upon the city. So here they are building, and as they're building, the haters come out, right? All of a sudden, the naysayers are coming out and saying, oh, pfft. You know, even if a fox ran up and jumped on that wall, it'd fall down. Get it to about half height, and they're going, hey, hey, you guys, you guys can't be doing that. And they start sending letters, hey, we need to talk. You need to meet with us. And Nehemiah ignores it, and they send another letter. Nehemiah ignores it. They send another letter. Nehemiah ignores it. Finally, they send an open letter. See, an open letter was different. That meant that whoever passed by could read that letter. Before, if it was sealed, they wouldn't open it. It only went to the person to whom it was delivered, but now they send an open letter. What are they doing? They're gossiping. They're spreading it all over Twitter and Facebook, right? <laughs> and they're saying, hey, we know what you're doing. We know that you've decided to make yourself king, Nehemiah, and that you've even got prophets that are going to proclaim that there's a king in Jerusalem, and that's why you're building the walls, because you're going to rebel against the real king. Now, all of a sudden, these are accusations. These are things that could stop them, and we find out what Nehemiah does in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse number 9. He just gets done saying, I'm not doing anything of the sort. Nehemiah never entertained their threats, never entertained their stupidity, never, never gave in to their buffoonery. <laughs> Nehemiah just says, uh, no, that's not what we're doing. Verse number 9. For they were all trying to make us afraid saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. Look at what happens. He prays, now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. See, there are gonna be situations, times, where you're trying to do something for God. You're building the wall of your life. You're strengthening yourself. And the haters are gonna come along and they're gonna say, hey, you can't do that. That's not right. That's not the way it should be done. What are you doing with this Jesus stuff? You need to back off of that. You, you can't go to church. You're crazy. Why are you wasting your time? Why are you spending your money on that? They never cared about how you spent your money before, but now that you're giving it to church, all of a sudden they're all up in a roar, right? Ruffled their feathers. And they're going to say, you're stupid. You're going to fail. Your family's going to fail. It's not real. But don't entertain those thoughts. Why? Because that's the enemy coming against you. And all you have to do is say, no, not going to listen to it, and then pray and strengthen yourself in the Lord with a simple prayer. Strengthen my hands, oh God. There were so many distractions that tried to come against the work, but Nehemiah persevered. He continued on. Finally, they hung the gates. They, they, they set everything in order, and then their enemies had nothing to say. The great verse, if you turn there with me in the book of James, right after the book of Hebrews is the book of James, kind of towards the back of your Bible. If you hit the maps, turn around. You went too far. James chapter 1, talking about in prayer and in perseverance, we'll get it together. We've seen prayer, now let's take a look at perseverance. James chapter 1, starting in verse number 2, reading through verse number 4. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, wait a second. Hold on. We just got done saying we don't like suffering. We just got done agreeing, and I, and I heard a hearty amen, that we do not like suffering. No one likes pressure. No one likes trials and temptations. But the Word's telling us to count it all joy? Put a smile on your face, rejoice, and be happy? Why? Verse number three, knowing... Everybody say knowing. knowing. See, when the word says we ought to know something, we ought to know it. And know it doesn't mean, oh, I could quote that verse. No, knowing it means that you do it. So we ought to know this and we ought to incorporate it into our life, knowing that the testing of your faith produces 
patience. Patience also could be translated endurance or perseverance. Verse number four, but let patience have its perfect work. What does that mean? Let patience have its complete work. Let it run its course. Uh, we, my, recently, my son had to go to the doctor, and he had an infection, and so we had to get him on antibiotics. And they tell you, let the antibiotics run their course. Don't just stop halfway through. Don't miss, right? And, and even if he starts to show signs of getting better, let it run its course and continue to give it to him. Why? Because it needs to finish its work. This is the medicine. God's word is God's medicine. And you need to allow it to run its course in your life. You need to carry it through. You need to be patient. You need to endure. You need to take it to prayer. And God says, wait. God says, persevere. God says, endure. God says, go on. God says, do not give up. Do not quit. Don't stop. I want you to continue on. And we need to let patience, endurance, perseverance have its perfect work. Why? That you may be perfect. So let patience have its complete work. Why? So that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Wow. Lacking nothing. That means that you have everything you need. You are supplied. You're equipped. So how do we get it together? Number one, in church. Never devalue coming to church and staying in church. Hello. Hello. Second thing is in prayer and in perseverance. Finally, the third thing for tonight. How do we get it together? In godly relationships. Notice that I put that word godly up there. The reason why I have had to say godly relationships is because some relationships will tear you apart. Some relationships will just weaken you. Some relationships will make you fall apart. But godly relationships, you can, you can tell whether it was a godly or an ungodly relationship because when you're, when you're leaving the presence of that person, if you feel built up and strengthened, encouraged, hey, that's godly. They just built you up. They just helped you get it together. But if you re- leave that relationship feeling sick, you know, you just don't feel right, you, don't, you, know, you kind of feel dirty. Some people, you, you, you have a conversation with them and you want to take a shower afterwards. That is an ungodly relationship. It's not the will of God for your life. And so you need to have godly relationships that help you to get it together. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to abandon every person that's ungodly because then you'd have to just leave the world, right? You you go to the job and there's ungodly people on the job. You you go to the store, there's ungodly people at the store. You know, there's neighbors that are ungodly, all that kind of stuff. You're not going to get away from them. But you're supposed to minister to them. But you know what? When, When you start falling apart, you don't go to those ungodly relationships. You don't go to the neighbor who's got the can of brew in his hand and he's offering you one to talk about your marital issues you're going to get the wrong information okay when you're having financial struggles your boss that's ungodly is not going to be the one that tells you hey this is how you should properly steward your finances according to the word of god no that's not going to be his response okay he's going to tell you some ungodly advice if he's an ungodly person So we've got to have godly relationships in our life that can direct us in the right way. And when we're falling apart, they can help us get it together. They can come alongside of us and they can build us up and they can encourage us. You know, David, he strengthened himself in the Lord, right? But there's another scripture before that that talks about how when King Saul was wanting to kill David, that Jonathan went to David and strengthened his hand in the Lord. What does that mean? That means that Jonathan went to David and said, David, I know you're falling apart, man. Come on, let's pray together. Let's, let's give this to God. You can do this. You can, you can be strong. You, you can handle this, David. I know you're the next king. I know that God's got plans for you. You just hold on and watch what God does in your life. See, see that's, that's a good friend going and strengthening someone else. We need to have people in our life that can tell us no and still be our friend. That was a mildly okay response. (laughs) But think about it for a second. If you're out there and your life has fallen apart, and and, and if you're caught up in something that you shouldn't be in, you should have somebody that's godly enough to come to recognize it and to tell you no. And they're still your friend. It helps. Whether that person is your spouse 
whether that person is your best friend, whether that person is, you know, somebody that you look to as a mentor or somebody that you respect in the, in the Lord that's, that's older than you. If you're single, make sure that that's the same sex, you know, you're looking up to a man, not, you know, going after a woman or something like that, because that just gives the devil place. Hello? Doesn't mean you can't have godly friendships, but hey, if, it, if it's a deep, intimate relationship, then, then you need to cultivate that first with the same sex so that you don't get caught up in sin. And then after that, when you get married, then that changes over to your spouse. You see? Just thought, I, just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> Put that in there. Probably for somebody. But it does help to have somebody in your life that can look at your life from an outside perspective and say, hey, listen, I see you're falling apart in this area. Let's talk about this. Let's look at it. Let's pray together. You see, it's a neat thing when you can call someone on the phone, you can just bounce things off of them, bounce ideas off of them, and they know you well enough to say, hey, look, look, no, not a good idea. Uh Uh-uh, right? And all of a sudden, where you would have been falling apart, where you would have been compromised, they can get it back together. Last verse for tonight, Galatians chapter 6, verse number 1. Galatians chapter 6, turn there with me. You've already been in Ephesians, right before Ephesians is Galatians. And in Galatians chapter number 6, verse number 1, it says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. What he's saying is, he's saying if you are in a stable place, if your life is put together and you're spiritual, Oftentimes, the people that are spiritual are the ones that don't view themselves as spiritual. Know what I mean by that? It, where they say, you know what, they, they understand. That's, that's where the last part of that verse comes in. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Most of the time, the mature ones are the ones that say, hey, I know that I'm human. I know that I have limitations. I know that I've been in that spot before. I know that I've had a weakness here before. And I can see my brother going into the same direction. I can see my sisters falling apart in this area. And so they go to them in a spirit of gentleness, in a spirit of meekness. They, they, they come under submission to the word, and they say, hey, listen, let's talk about this. I can see that you're going the wrong way. That, that trespass means, means a sin in the wrong direction. You think about they crossed a line, right? You've got a fence that says no trespassing, and they just crossed that fence, right? What happened? They're trespassing now. They're going in an area that they're not supposed to be. And it says, you who are spiritual, restore, set them in place, perfect them, complete them. That's what godly relationships are for, is to encourage us, to have fellowship, to edify us, to build us up, but also to restore us. Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. See, we need to know that, hey, I could fall into this just as easily. I I, I have the same capability. I have the same, you know, the Bible says, watch yourself, lest ye fall. Check yourself out. Make sure, test yourself. See whether or not you're in the faith. And that's how you're going to look at someone else's life once you realize. The Bible says take the plank out of your own eye before you go and take the plank out of somebody else's eye, right? The little speck of dirt that's in their eye. Heard a story of a man who fell into an icy river and there he was splashing, trying to get out and some guys ran over and they, they pulled a stick out of the water, a big stick that they had. They pulled the stick out of the water and they extended the stick out to the guy and the guy's grabbing at the stick but every time he grabbed at it, his hands were slipping off because the way they pulled the stick out, they handed him the end that was in the water. And so it was this icy, cold, wet end of the stick and he's slipping off and finally he yelled at him, guys, give me the other end of the stick. And so they realized what was going on, they flipped it around and they were able to pull him out. See, if you go to somebody and you're trying to restore them and you're giving them the icy end of the stick... It's not going to help them. What do I mean by the icy end of the stick? I mean, if you go to them in judgment, criticism, condemnation, I'm more spiritual than you are. Therefore, I'm going to tell you this. If you're looking down your nose at them, that's not going to help them. But when you turn it around, hey, I, I could go through the same thing or I've been through the same thing. Now, let me extend some help to you and get you out of the area that you're not supposed to be in. That's going to help them. So tonight we learned three things. We could have talked about 30 things. How do we get it together? Number one is in church. Number two is in prayer and in perseverance. And number three is in godly relationships. If you got something from the word of the Lord tonight, come on, give God a great big praise. (laughs) Hallelujah. God is good. I want to talk to some of you guys in this room. I want you just to focus in for a moment. I'll let you go in a minute. But I need you to 
take inventory of yourself for a moment. I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. Here's the question. Just answer it silently, quietly in your heart. What makes you think you're going to heaven? I don't think anybody in this room wants to go to hell. Sometimes people hear that word and they say, well, I don't believe in hell. And therefore, I'm going to go to heaven. But did you know that just by denying the existence of something doesn't make it not real? It's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. Well, go out and stand on the slow lane of the freeway. You'll meet one face to face sooner or later. And the Old and New Testament talks about hell. Jesus talked about hell. Therefore, it's a very real place. Just because you say you don't believe in it doesn't make it any less real. And therefore, I don't want any of you to go there. God doesn't want any of you to go there. So listen up for a moment and give me your attention. Take inventory of yourself. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Is it because you've been good? Because you lived a good life, did good things? You know that nowhere in the Bible does God say that you can be good enough to get to heaven. We talked about that. Because the standard is perfection. Talking about moral purity and holiness and sinlessness before the Lord. There was only one who was perfect in that sense, and that's Jesus. You're not going to get to heaven just by being good. Can't be good enough. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Is it because you were raised in church? Wore a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck? Parents had you baptized or christened as a child? You went to all the religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, Sabbath school class? Or because you were born in America and America is a Christian nation? What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Is it because you're not in the other religion? Well, let me tell you, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that wearing religious jewelry, being baptized or Christian as a child, going to religious classes, or being born in America qualifies you for heaven. It does not work like that. And again, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you in the category of being a Christian. You're saved, headed for heaven, denying hell. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Is it because you've been involved and attended church on a regular basis? You sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions, people thought of you as a leader, and you got a membership card to a church? Let me tell you something. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you get involved, attend church, Sing in the choir, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions, or people think of you as a leader that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. It's like saying you could sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. It does not work. There's a person sitting in your garage. Can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Can't get involved and think that that helps out any. God's not looking for your involvement to a church or your membership card. He's not checking at the gates of heaven for a membership card to a church. It doesn't work like that. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, I know God. I know about Jesus. Celebrate Easter and the resurrection and sing the songs of Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament, tell you stories out of the Bible. Therefore, I'm a Christian headed for heaven. But the problem with that is that if you read your Bible, you would know the Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible records the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and can quote scriptures. It's there in your Bible. Check it out. And yet the devil's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who he is. But rather this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always been about your heart. Jesus called it being born again. Now I know our society's made a mockery out of that term and they've raked it through the coals. This is not about what society says. But Jesus said, you must be born again again. So what does that mean? Well, it really means that you've given God all of your heart, like we talked about, and you followed up that commitment by giving God all of your life. If you haven't done that, then I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. Honor you and respect you enough not to play games. You're not going to make it. You must be born again. If you haven't been born again, you're not going to make it. This is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you in Revelation, the third chapter. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us in church tonight. And he says these words. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm. What's that all about? Well, here's what lukewarm means. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. A little church attendance. Occasional prayer. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not 
real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Let's do this God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. For those of you that have not been born again, and if you were to die tonight, you would go to hell. I'm going to count to three just like this. Say one, two, three, pop my hands together when I say three, just like this. Bang! That's your opportunity when I pop my hands. Bang! To raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Hold on. We'll do it all together, bud. Hands are already going up. Praise God. Let's do it all together. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying hell. I'll see it. I'll count it. You put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. Get over it. Because it's better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever. Listen, you probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, hey, you're on your way to heaven. That's good news. Tonight, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight you can make sure. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm and you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, get ready to get your hands up. Man, people are already getting their hands up and they're excited, so I'm not gonna take up any more time back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, all across this auditorium, back in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe or online. God's watching. You can get your hand up and then tell an usher right afterwards, come into the church service, or if you're online, click the blue button that says respond to God and then you'll be led in a prayer. In here, come on, I'm gonna pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Raise them up high. Thank you. There's one. There's two. Thank you. There's three up on top. God bless you. Real quick, where are you at? Where are you at? There's four. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Four wise people already. You can put your hand down. Thank you. Four wise people. Anybody else real quick? Real quick. Anybody real quick? Back there. Gotcha. There's five, six, seven. Thank you. God bless you guys. Seven wise people already. Up here. I'm pointing over here. Wave it at me real quick. Back in the family room. Thank you. There's eight. And down here, where are you at? Where are you at? Thank you. I got you right there. Thank you. God bless you. There's nine wise people already. Can't you just feel number 10? Number 10, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. You should. God just spoke to you right now. If that's you, you know God just spoke to your heart when I said that. Come on, lift your hand up. Lift your hand up. Anybody else real quick? Where are you at, number 10? Number 10, you're sitting there wondering if you should. Come on. Come on. Come on. Got you, number 10. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 10 wise people tonight. Hallelujah. All right. All 10 of you, or if you're number 11, number 12, number 13, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, a Bible. Get a hold of your friend if you need a friend. Get your stuff, in other words. Get a friend if you need a friend. And I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that until we get you down here. So if that's you, you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Come on, let's stand and welcome them. Let them come. No one leave. Just let them come right now. You come. You come. Because you're all Hallelujah, if you raise your hand, come on, come on, we're waiting for you. They're coming, let's give them a hand. From the family rooms, if you raise your hand, come on down, bring your kids. All right, anybody else? Come on, come on, come on. Don't wait. Even if you didn't raise your hand, you, could, you just come on. Get your stuff. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, everybody up front, look up here for a second. Put a smile on your face. This is a really good thing. This is not a bad thing, okay? I want you to be encouraged right now. Your life was falling apart. Now you're going to get it together with Jesus Christ, okay? You're going to be born again. Right over here to my right, your left, this guy in the cool hat, this is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? Sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Well, what's going to happen? No, he's cool, all right? He's going to do three things. I'm going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. He's going to give you some free information, some free literature that will help you find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then finally, he's going to introduce you to a friend in church that we call a spiritual personal trainer. All right? It's free. It's for you. It'll build you strong. It's a friend 
Remember we talked about godly relationships? Listen, those ungodly relationships in the world are going to tear you apart. And SPT is a friend that's going to build you strong and encourage you in the ways of the Lord so that you can be strengthened, you can be settled, you can be established in the ways of God. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.